Well, today we are continuing our series titled, Faith is the Currency of the Kingdom. And the last time we were together, we talked about how our spirit is the real us that's deep inside and is the part of us that was recreated or born again the moment that we accepted Jesus as our Lord and personal savior. You see, we all know that we were born of the spirit of God. And at that precious time, we became royalty in a kingdom, not of this world. And you'll hear me repeat this over and over because I want you to know that like you know your name. Now our soul, and I, I shared this the last time, our soul is different. You know, the world uses soul and spirit. They don't really explain the difference. You know, they use it as the same, and it is not the same. Your spirit is the real you. This earth suit that we're in, and can you just imagine when we get our glorified bodies, then we don't have to be concerned with calories. We can just eat all we want. Oh my goodness, I'm actually looking forward to that. Chocolate, I could just have it. Oh my goodness. Anyway, back to this. <laughs> the point is, our spirit is the real us. We're just in these earth suits. And oh man, if we could just get people to understand that, we wouldn't have all these challenges that we have now. But our soul, that's what makes us very unique. Because our soul, that's what consists of our mind, our intellect, our will, our emotion. And that's what makes me really enjoy chocolate. And some of you don't like it. And maybe you like pistachio or something, OK? But that's what makes us all different. Now, we know that when we were born again, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came to abide in us. And that's so exciting to me. I like that word because to abide means to dwell, to live, to take up residence, never to leave. That's a wonderful thing. That's a key point. Because when the Holy Spirit speaks, he speaks to our spirit. And then our spirit, which is the real us, communicates with our mind. And that is extremely important because as we know, we have an adversary who is also speaking to our mind with thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. That's why we're always on a battlefield when it comes to our mind. Now, in order for us to effectively hear our spirits, we need to do what? We need to feed them. And the same way that our minds and bodies are fed, our spirits can be fed. An interesting point to me is that we can overfeed our minds and our bodies, but we can never overfeed our spirits. That point, excuse me, can lead into a whole other teaching, and we're just going to have to table that for right now. So what makes our spirit stronger? How do we do that? Meaning we know, you know, if you want to become more intelligent or really exercise your intellect, you can go take courses, you know, you can go to universities or whatever and, and just increase your academia and that helps. If you want to change your physical bodies, you can go to the gym, you can work out, you can strength train, you can do whatever it is that you need to do that. But what do you do to build up your spirits? There is only one way and that way is the word of God. And here's the thing, in order to hear the voice of God in our spirits clearly, our spirits need to be nourished by God's word. Turn with me, and this is exactly where we left off last time we were together. Turn with me to Matthew's gospel, the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at verse four. Matthew's gospel, the fourth chapter, verse four. I'm going to share it with you first out of the easy to read version, and it says, Jesus answered him. The scriptures say, it is not just bread that keeps people alive. Their lives depend on what God says. The Amplified says, Jesus, but Jesus replied, it is written and forever remains written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And the message says, Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. Now, do me a favor and just turn real quickly to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. The New King James Version says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister 
of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. The Amplified says, if you point out these instructions to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished through study on the words of the faith and of the good Christian doctrine which you have closely followed. These basically are very clearly telling us it's not just good enough that we just heard something. We have to continue to what? We have to continue to study. And then we should share. And it doesn't mean that you beat people over the head with the word. It just means that you share it with them. You know, when you find something that's exciting and you sit around the dinner table, even though I know nowadays most people don't do that. Everybody's trying to go get some fast food out of a little bag or something. But you know, when you just sit around the dinner table, what are you talking about? Are you sharing the word? Because that it's important. It's very, very important. It is more important than the food that you're sitting there trying to nourish your body with. So that's something we need to be mindful of and do. If we look at this verse of scripture in the message, it says, you've been raised on the message of the faith and have followed sound teaching. Now pass on this counsel to the followers of Jesus there, and you'll be a good servant of Jesus. Stay clear of silly stories and get dressed up. That get dressed up as religion. Hmm, okay. Exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness, please. Workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so, making you fit both today and forever. You can count on this. Take it to heart. This is why we've thrown ourselves into this venture so totally. We're, break, we're banking on the living God, savior of all men and women, especially believers. Now the Bible instructs us in Romans 10, 17, and we know this, you can turn to it or jot it down. We all pretty much can quote it out of the New King James Version, which we're mostly familiar with, where it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we look at it in the Amplifier with the qualifiers, it says, so faith comes from hearing, here's the qualifier, what is told. And what is heard comes by the preaching of the message concerning Christ. Now, I like this out of the Message Bible, and it says, but how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? That's why scripture exclaims, a sight to take your breath away, grand processions of people telling all the good things of God. But not everybody is ready for this, ready to see and hear and act. Isaiah asked what we all ask at one time or another, does anyone care, God? Now that's something, I'm gonna pause here, that's something a lot of people are asking right now when they look at all that's happening in the world. Even Christians are actually posing that question and they're asking, does God really care? Is anyone listening and believing a word of it? The point is, before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there's nothing to listen to. Notice that hearing the word of God causes our faith to grow, as well as feeding our spirit. Also note that the scripture does not say, so then faith comes by having heard. It specifically said, faith comes by hearing. That means present tense, continually, and so on. As long as we live, we cannot hear too much of the word. In other words, you can never overfeed. We can never overfeed our spirits. It's impossible. Now, if we could hear too much, the spirit of God might have said, faith comes by having heard. If that were the case, then all we would need to do is to hear the word once, and we would have received all the faith needed. This is clearly not the case. 
So faith does not come by having heard. Now I submit to you, even the world understands this principle. And I can prove it to you. When you sit and watch your favorite television show, make a note of how many times a sponsor advertises a product. I mean, you really think about that, okay? They will run the same commercial over and over again throughout several programs, if need be, just to get your attention. Why do they do this? Because they understand this principle and they know if they present a particular product over and over again, it will be drummed into our minds. Then when we're in the store, without even recognizing it, we remember that Charmin makes a softer toilet tissue and we must buy Cottonelle that our bums are as clean as a sparkling mermaid. The advertisement doesn't even have to make sense. What is a sparkling mermaid? It doesn't make sense, okay? But we have faith for it. So that, it drives us to make the purchase. Now, I'll prove it to you. Let's have a quiz. <laughs> if I say to you, like a good neighbor, what do you think of? Stay Farm, see, you already know that, okay? And then if I say, I am stuck on Band-Aids, when you go to buy Band-Aids, what are you gonna buy? Are you gonna buy Cure-Ed? No, you're gonna buy Band-Aids, cause Band-Aids stuck on me. And then if you really want good insurance and you wanna be in the good hands, who do you think of? Allstate, no, it's Allstate. Oh, come on. See, all states not doing a great job because you all weren't sure about that one. So they need to work on that, okay? But the point is, do you see how you knew that? Because you hear it over and over again. <laughs> hmm. uh, I had several people, as a matter of fact, this was funny, come up to me last year when our granddaughter was born, whose name is Honora Noel. That is her name. However, people were coming up to me telling me that I see the commercial for this new drug being introduced named Anoro. Now, it's not the same at all, but the fact that they could remember and make the correlation, that means that the company was doing a really, really good job. And anytime these folks even can get us to do such a thing, then they're on what they're supposed to do. But think about it, if advertisers spend as much time as they do to have us remember a product to buy, how much more do we need to spend time hearing the word to get it deep down into our spirits to affect a change in our lives? On top of that, please know that the enemy plans in any way that he can to snatch the word that you hear away from you. He really doesn't give a care about your toilet tissue, but he always wants to steal the word. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Matthew 13, verses 3 and 4. In the New King James Version, it says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. If we look at it in the Amplified, it says, he told them many things in parables, saying, listen carefully, a sower went out to sow seed in his field, and as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, between the fields, and the birds came and ate it. When we interpret this parable, the seed is the word. The birds of the air are Satan and his cohorts who come to snatch the seed before it has a chance to take root and become strong. That is what happens with the word for so many people. They superficially hear the gist of the word, which does not take root in the good soil of their hearts. And as this happens, the stage is set for Satan to arrive on the scene with circumstances that capture their attention, their faith is weak, and they stumble before reaching their victory. That is so true. There are people in churches right today all over America who are coming out of, I believe they really do love God, 
but they're coming, they're hearing something where they're just getting like a little gist, like a little cliff note or a little synopsis of something with the word. And, you know, it's not something that they can really hold on to. They're not going home studying it. You know, like, I don't want to put any people on blast, but, you know, Minister Scott does such an extraordinary job when he teaches. And not just that. He literally gives us textbook quality information to take home. He doesn't do that because he just has nothing else to do with his time. You know, like he just wanted to do that. No. Okay. And I don't even want to, I'm, I'm not going to put anybody on blast. And I would, I, I wonder, I just wonder how many people take that material home and do anything other than put it somewhere. You know, like it's on a table somewhere, or, and if it's in a circular file, God will hold you accountable for that. But the point of the matter is, we're so busy. How much time do we take to really study it so that we can grow thereby? That's something you need to think about. That's something that you need to consider because you see, the things that are in there are building up your spirit, man, so that when the circumstances of life come, you can stand confidently knowing as Brother Keith ministered that God has already made a way because your spirit is strong and you are fortified so you're not moved by all of the circumstances of the storm. But if you're not feeding your spirit, you're no different than a malnourished person who needs to eat some food. Something to think about. The word of God is so important to living a life filled with faith why? Because it's also pleasing to God. Turn with me to Hebrews 11, and we're just going to look at the sixth verse. Hebrews 11, verse 6. The New King James Version says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we look at it in the Amplified with the qualifiers, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to, here's the qualifier, walk with God and please him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. And the message says, by an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. It is truly understanding how faith works. If we really want to understand it, we all that are believers, we have the best lesson that there is. We can simply go back to the beginning of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Turn with me to a scripture that I know that you know, but I'm going to give you some translations to expound upon it, and that is Romans 10, 9, and 10. All of us should know verbatim the New King James Version that says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Listen to it with the qualifiers out of the Amplified. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, here's the qualifier, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes in Christ as Savior, resulting in his justification. That is, being made righteous, being freed of the guilt of sin, and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. That particular translation alone, if you share it with people, makes it abundantly clear. That's why translations, I cannot stress to you enough, 
the importance of looking at more than just one translation because we all learn differently. We all hear things differently. And if you're not hearing it, where it can reach into your mind and understand it to then get into your heart and affect your belief system, you have done yourself a big disservice. If we look at it in the message, it says this, the earlier revelation was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah, who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy. Every detail of life regulated by fine print, but trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah, no dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. So what exactly was Moses saying? The word that saves is right here, as near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. It's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Say the welcoming word to God. Jesus is my master, embracing body and soul. God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God, setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. Isn't that something? Now that is the message. Same two verses of scripture. Isn't it a little bit more illuminating? I know, I think so. <laughs> now, according to the scripture, the most amazing miracle the universe has ever known was accomplished through two things. Confessing with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and believing that God has raised him from the dead. Those two actions brought us salvation and an eternity in God's presence. Again, it made us royalty in a kingdom not of this world. Now I want to point out something important about these two verses. They say to believe in your heart and with the heart one believes. We can say that faith is an action of the heart. Our heart is where faith is located and operates from. You see, we hear the word first with our ears but it still has to penetrate down into our hearts or our spirits before it becomes spiritual faith. In other words, we hear the word twice, first with our ears and then with our spirits. Since faith does come by hearing, it is imperative that we as Christians guard our ear gates because whatever we hear is going to affect our faith, either positively or negatively. That is so key. So if you are believing God for increase in your finances and you turn on the TV and you listen to whatever rhetoric they're spewing, okay, and they make you think, well, I'm not going to give so much of an offering because I need to put money in the bank in my 401k. I'm betting my life on that 401k and they're doing this and they're making changes here and what if my company does that? All of that stuff that you are allowing to come into your ear gates, you need to put a guard on it. What does the word of God say? That's what you need to hear. And you need to hear that over and over because the word of God is the truth. That stuff that's on TV, that changes. And one thing I will say without question, I agree 100% when the statement was made. When it comes to the things that come on the news and that come from the White House, they are always alternative facts. You never know, because it'll be one thing this morning, you can turn it on at six o'clock, it's changed, and if you turn it on at midnight, it's a totally different story. So am I gonna believe that? No, I'm gonna believe the truth, because that I can stand on. It's very, very important. Very, very important. So turn with me to Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at verse 24 this time. Mark 4, 24. And it says in the New King James Version, Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. 
With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. The easy to read version says, think carefully about what you're hearing. God will know how much to give you by how much you understand now. But he will give you more than you deserve. That's so key. The Amplified says, and he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study, that's the qualifier of thought and study, you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more besides will be given to you who hear. Remember, your ears are the gateway to your spirit. They are the mechanisms by which faith comes. If we look at Colossians, turn there. Colossians, the second chapter, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. If we look at it in the New King James Version, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. If we look at it in the Amplified, it says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in union with him, reflecting his character in the things you do and say, living lives that lead others away from sin, having been deeply rooted in him and now being continually built up in him, and becoming increasingly more established in your faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing in it with gratitude. The message says, my counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. <laughs> You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. So important. Now let me bring back to your remembrance another scripture that we all know and we all can definitely quote. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. In the New King James Version, and the church said, for we walk by faith, not by sight. If we look at it in the Amplified, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Here is the qualifier. Living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. I like that. And if we look at it in the message, it says, that's why we live with such good cheer. We won't, you won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramp conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in, but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. The question that remains, your own personal qualifier is, are you believing in your heart and walking by faith? That is something that you've got to think about. Now, please keep in mind that your faith does not come by your praying for it. It does not come by reading the Bible either. We just read in Romans 10, 17 earlier, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The qualifier being the word of God. This is important because all of us, I'm sure if you haven't had personal experience, I hope that you have not, but you may know of someone who might have been a student in school and a teacher might have 
imparted into their life or professed over them that, you know, you're just terrible in math. You're never going to be good in math. Or you may have heard, well, you're a girl. Girls aren't good in math. Boys are always better in math. Or you're not really athletic, so we'll just let you sit on the bench. You're never going to make varsity on a team. People just say things and impart things into your life. And that's why I am so, I mean, when it comes to if you have any at all contact with little people, make sure that what you are saying to them lines up with the word of God or please do not speak to them because what you are saying, one word can change their entire life. It's so important because we do have faith for what we hear. That's why the qualifier in this lesson is that we've got to hear the word of God over and over and over because you know something? Our human spirits, it's like we hear everything like a sponge. We soak it in, but our minds, because we're in this world so much, it's almost like it's easier for us to believe the negative things. Meaning like if I were to sit up and I were to say to you, you know what, you might be believing for your finances and right now, you know, you might, you know, you might have an adequate amount to meet your needs, but say you really want to have more because you really want to give into the kingdom. And I say to you, well, you know what? I'm going to get into agreement with you, and I believe that you will become a millionaire. And that's something that you can have in 2020 so that you can give more into the kingdom. You might look at that like, okay. Now, if I would sit up and say to you, well, you know, they said with what's going on with the economy, they're going to change some things with the taxes and the tax cuts are going to change so that only the 1% period are going to get anything. They're going to take away even more of our deductions so we're really going to have a hard time. I submit to you it will be easier for you to believe that than it would be you becoming a millionaire in 2020. So that's why I'm saying to you it's so important that you are paying attention to what you're hearing because it does affect your faith. That is so, so, so important. We definitely hear enough while we're living in this world that is contrary to the word. We've got to become disciplined and make time to hear the word over and over again so that it be can become rooted in our spirits. I almost feel bad that we don't any longer have those little Walkman things, you know, that you could put a CD in and just travel with. Because one of the things that we did early on, and we still do, we would put something in the car, because we're in the car a lot. Just like here, they have mass transit. They don't have a lot of mass transit where I live, so we have to get around in cars. But we hear the word in the car. And even if you're driving, you can even be having a conversation. But if the word is going on, it's still feeding your spirit. You are still hearing it, and your faith can grow. And we need to do more of that. So that's why it's so wonderful. We're putting things on podcasts. You can do the same thing with your phone. If you have a smartphone, you're standing on the platform waiting for the C train. Hear what's being said. Listen to a lesson while you're standing there waiting so that your spirit can be fed. I promise you, if you do that, you will see the dis you'll see the difference. You will see the difference it makes in your life. And it's very, very key that we do this because God's word will continually, this is important, reinforce the mental image of God's promise that hope has created there. Our faith will always manifest the promise of God's word as long as we continue to hold fast and never, ever give up. I submit to you, and you can jot this down. I'm not going to share it with you now because I really want to share something else. Jot this down. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. No, I'm going to share it. I have to. Okay, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 25. I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. And it says this, Therefore, believers, since we have confidence and full freedom to enter the holy place, the place where God dwells, by means of the blood of Christ, by this new and living way, which he initiated and opened for us through the veil as in the holy of holies, that is, through his flesh, 
And since we have a great and wonderful priest who rules over the house of God, let us approach God with a true and sincere heart in unqualified assurance of faith, having had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. That is so, so key. I submit to you that even if you're having a challenge, truly believing a promise in the word, it is because you haven't reached the level of trust in that particular promise. How do you remedy that, you may ask? Because that's a good question. By hearing the word and the promise contained therein over and over and over again. Just keep saying, the qualifier here is saying what the word says so that your ears can hear it and it can get down into your spirit. So if you are believing God for healing, you get those healing scriptures and you say them out loud with your mouth over and over and over again. If you're believing for your children to be saved, it's not a thought. You speak it out loud over and over and over again. Turn with me to Luke's gospel, the eighth chapter, and we're going to look at verse 18. Luke's gospel, the eighth chapter, verse 18. The New King James Version says, Therefore take heed how you hear, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Now, that may sound a little convoluted to some, so here it is in the Amplified. So be careful how you listen. For whoever has a teachable heart, that's key, to him more understanding will be given. And whoever does not have a longing for truth, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. It's sort of like, you know, we hear, if you don't use a muscle group, you lose it. Well, if you are not really trying to hear the word and hunger after it, whatever little bit that you think you knew, it kind of just kind of dissipates and you sort of forget it because you are so bogged down with all the other stuff that you're hearing. Because again, you are going to have faith for what it is that you hear. The easy to read version says, so think carefully about what you're hearing. The people who have some understanding will receive more, but those who do not have understanding will lose even what they think they have. So if you keep saying what the word says about any situation in your life over and over, and this is why confession is so important, you will begin to believe it. Your belief system is in your heart where your faith resides. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, so shall he speak. If you create an image of victory based upon the word of God, believe it in your heart, develop faith for it, confess it with your mouth, you will have it. It's just that simple. This is the same format that God used in everything that he created. And we are created in his image and his likeness. We are his children. The same format applies to us. Whatever you need, it is in your mouth. Received by faith, developed by the word of God. So you may be thinking, all of this makes sense for a seasoned Christian. For people who've been disciples of Christ for years, this is to be expected. But for someone who's just beginning to understand the word, you know, maybe they shouldn't expect this to happen so easily for them. That is simply a myth for this reason. God is not a respecter of persons and there is no time allotted to your faith. You just simply must believe. 
also know there are people who have attended church for 50 or 60 years and still have no understanding of the word. They just go because they think it's a good thing to do. And like I said earlier, they just get a gist of it, but they don't have any understanding of it. And the key is that in all you're getting, get understanding. And the great news is that whenever you get that understanding, it doesn't matter, whenever you get it, it is a good thing. Because God is not bound by time in any way, shape, or form. Now I'm going to give you a personal example because I can always talk about stuff in my life and be authentic and stand up here and look silly. Nobody gets hurt by that. <laughs> so that's why I do it. I was a baby Christian attending a prominent church with over 3,500 members who met every Sunday. And it was a church that did teach the uncompromising word of God without question. We actually attended this church because it was the host church for the apostle and Dr. Betty when they did crusades in the area back in the early 1980s, okay? Now, for those of you who know my testimony, which I'm not gonna give now, but the fact is I was born again on one of those crusades, August 24th, 1984. I thought I was born again before, but I had never seen Romans 10, 9, and 10. Went to a Baptist church, was busy in the church all day, and was still going to go to hell in a handbasket because I had never confessed Jesus but didn't know. And that's why my heart is so <laughs> sensitive to people being able to accept Christ because I believe, I know, I don't have to believe, I know that there are people just like I was who think that they're saved and they're not. Okay, so the point was, I was born again in 1984. Now, we had our second son born to us in 19. 85. And when he was born, as you know how babies start kind of like toddling around and you see different characteristics of, about them, he had little bow legs, okay? And they actually were kind of cute, you know, because when you're first toddling around, it's like, oh, that's so cute. But it seemed like his legs were starting to bow more, you know, to almost look like semicircles, okay? And that's not actually what you want to have for a child. And what started to happen as he started to kind of like walk around and the legs started to bow more, I started to hear a lot of chatter. Now I call it chatter because that's what it really was. You know, people talking like, oh, look at those legs. Oh, well, you know, he's not gonna be able to walk and oh, you're gonna have to have surgery. And see, here's the interesting thing to me. I was hearing this from people in the body of Christ. I wasn't hearing it from, I mean, strangers might have said it, but you know, you know how when you come to church, you're in the midst of your family, your heavenly family that you're going to spend eternity with. So when they say something to you, it has more meaning than it's just some stranger on the street. And I was a baby Christian. So when I'm hearing these great women of God say all of these things, and sometimes men too, but you know, I spoke more with the women, it really got my attention. And I recognized that I had to think about what I was going to do. Now, I'm going to run a little over. I'm telling you that now. It'll probably be about five minutes, but I need to share this. Um, at this time, <laughs> we also were just starting to really understand the word, and we didn't have a lot of money. So this was my fourth child, and I had no health insurance, which meant I couldn't just go take my child to the orthopedic surgeon to see what he was going to say. I really couldn't even afford to take him to the pediatrician to see what he was going to say, because that's how little money I had in my hand at that time. And again, the thing that I think is interesting People will get up and they tell you all the rah-rah stories. They tell you all the great news. They don't want to tell you the authentic things that happen. That's why I guess I get the assignment, and I don't care. I will stand before you. Well, I won't be naked because that's too much. But I will stand before you and give it all to you because if it helps you, that's my goal. Well, we didn't have the money for it, so I'm hearing this chatter, and I'm looking at this child's legs and understand the enemy is constantly feeding me with what? Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. What are you going to do, okay? Because you can't, he has to be able to walk. This is your fourth child. So, you know, what are you going to do? 
So I sat there and I said, you know what? I don't have insurance and I don't have money because see, in America, it's very interesting with this country, if you have enough money, you can overcome what you don't have. Like, you know, you may not have medical insurance, but if you have enough money and you go into the hospital and say, okay, you're telling me it's gonna cost $100,000, here it is, they'll go ahead and do it. They don't care, okay? Well, I was sitting in a position where I didn't have the medical insurance and I didn't have the cash money to be able to take care of it. And this is something I always want you to get. Sometimes when you're in the midst of something, the enemy will point out what you don't have. What you need to do is remember what you do have and remember whose you are. So no, I was a baby Christian, didn't have insurance, didn't have money, but I had the word and I had the promise that healing belonged to me. It was part of my salvation. That's why when we minister salvation here, it's no little pity pat, come here, yes, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and you're out. We share with you what comes in that covenant package and healing, I knew that because I went to a crusade, that's where I received my salvation. So I said, hmm, I may not have all that, but I do have that promise. And you know what else I have? I've got faith. And faith was the currency that I needed at that point in time. So I remember it was a Sunday morning and I went to serve in the nursery because I love children, love to be in the nursery. So I was serving that day. And oh boy, it seemed like I was just hit hard with all of these people telling me how I needed to take this child to the doctor. And here's the thing, not only were they saying that, now they're making me feel bad because they're like, the fact that you haven't taken him to the doctor, you're a horrible parent. What kind of parent are you not seeing after this? I mean, it was rough. this was a rough Sunday. So this nursery was huge. And we had a section of the nursery where you could go um, like if a child came and the child was having symptoms, they separated them out from, you know, the children that weren't having symptoms. So this particular Sunday, nobody was in that section of the nursery. I took my son, I'm a baby Christian now, I want you to see this. And I remember going to that part of the nursery, and in the natural, I just felt like somebody had beat me up because I had been hearing this for a while, and that particular day, all of these people, you know, and it was like the head of the nursery. I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? And I really respected these women because they knew more than I did. I was a baby Christian, and they weren't. I remember going with my back up against the wall for real, literally, and sliding down the wall onto the floor. And I remember holding my son and I remember praying. I did not know the word like I know it now. I didn't know all that. But I knew that I trusted God. And I laid hands on my son. And I believed God that his legs would straighten out. And I asked the Lord to please straighten them and make them healthy and strong for all the days of his life. And I had nothing to hold on to but my faith. You see, for me, faith was a currency because I didn't have the money for all the rest of that stuff, but I had my faith. And you know something? I stood on that. And we'd go home, and this was not an instant thing. So when we tell you keep that switch of faith turned on, that's not something we just say because it sounds good. We mean that. So we, I went home, you know, and he would play around like any other little child because he's about two and a half. And, you know, whenever I'd see him, I would always speak and say, Father, I thank you that Austin's legs are straight and strong and will be all the days of his life. It looked like the bow was almost looking like it was getting worse, but I kept speaking what I believed. I'll never forget this day. I should have written it down. But I was a baby Christian, so I didn't understand the importance of, you know, a prayer journal. <laughs> I know all that then. But I was standing there cooking dinner. I remember exactly what I was making. And my son was running, you know, around playing. 
And this was, we used to have paper boys. Like, I don't know, like now they don't. Everything's digital. People don't even necessarily get newspapers. But we used to actually have the newspaper delivered, and the paper boy would come by every Friday, so I knew it was on a Friday, to collect his money for the, for the week. So, and my house, the way it's situated, it's a high ranch. So the point being is, from my front door, if the screen door is open, you can literally see up the steps. So you can see that level. So here I was in the kitchen, and my kitchen is off of that. So here I was, and the paper boy comes, he rings the bell, and I turned around, I go, okay, just a minute, because I knew I was going to have to go get my purse, you know, to pay him. And he goes, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson. So I turned around real quick. And he goes, look at Austin. His legs are straight as arrows. Oh, I'm telling you. <sighs> the point is this. It doesn't matter what you think you don't have. God is, like Brother Oliver mentioned earlier, He's making a way behind the scenes as long as you don't give up and trust him. You have got to trust him. It does not matter what it looks like, but if you believe him, he will never fail you. He will never, ever fail you. The promise that I was standing on was fulfilled. Faith provided the solution that the world could not offer me. I was a baby Christian, true. But I did, and I didn't even know I was really doing this. Listen to this. I did what the Heavenly Father did. I followed his format. Now I was a baby. I didn't even know that there was this format. I created an image of God's promise of healing. I did that when I prayed. It became my hope or my blueprint, as we've learned in the Thursday Bible class. That was a different, that's a study, the significance of hope, when you can listen to that. And you'll see what it means when it says blueprint. I believed the word's promise of healing, and I acted on what I believed by faith, speaking it into existence. I didn't know, like I said before, I didn't know that much about scripture at the time. But I trusted the God who saved me. He saved me. So there was no way that he could not heal my son. I took him at his word and believed that he would not lie. And you know what? <laughs> he has never lied to me. And I know that he never will. Remember that faith's greatest enemy is doubt. Who is the constant source of doubt if allowed? Satan. Actually, it is his job. Turn with me to John's Gospel, the 10th chapter and the 10th verse. And many of you know this scripture too. If we look at it in the New King James Version, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. The Amplified says the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. And the message says Jesus told this simple story, but they had no idea what he was talking about. So he tried again. I'll be explicit then. I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good. Sheep stealers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. His job is to steal the word. But here's the key. When he steals the word, what is he doing? He's killing your faith. Because remember, faith cometh by hearing. If you're not hearing the word, he is, in fact, killing your faith. Then he has you right where he wants you to be. Because then, and only then, he can destroy you. 
We are always in battle, always. Last thing I'm going to share with you is turn to Ephesians 6, verse 16. Ephesians 6, verse 16. The New King James Version says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The Amplified says, above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Keep in mind, the shield of faith, it's not some little tiny shield that we see. The shield of faith during that time, if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, think of that. It was a huge shield that you could hunker down under. I mean, a big 300-pound six-foot man could hunker down behind the shield and they actually would soak it in water before battle so that if any of the firing missiles were thrown on the shield it would just quench them so that's where that comes from it's not just something cute to say and if you look at it in the message it says be prepared you're up against far more than you can handle on your own take all the help you can get every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep, keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. God has already prepared us to win. We just simply need to constantly feed our spirits with the word of God, build our faith, and expect nothing less than victory. The word of God must become the final authority in our lives. Our faith must constantly increase and grow as it is the currency of the kingdom. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28590 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. 
And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.